it's just connecting and good afternoon everyone so in our lunchtime session today uh, we're going to talk about the national transport commission's work on reviewing the heavy vehicle national law i'm bill mckinley the ata's chief of staff and i'll be moderating this session so the heavy vehicle national law applies in the eastern states and south australia Amongst other things, it regulates vehicle standards, inspections, defects, and truck access to the road system. The law is complicated and it's inconsistent, which is why it's being reviewed. Our presenter today is Mandy Mees, who is the NTC's Head of Safety Reform. Mandy established an advertising career in Australia and the United Kingdom, before moving to Germany to develop an international marketing communications business. More recently, as Executive Director of Policy at Roads Australia, Mandy led the strategic development and implementation of the organisation's national policy program. So don't hesitate to ask questions or share your thoughts in the chat feed on your screen, and we'll have a discussion about your thoughts and questions at the end of Mandy's presentation. So here now, Mandy Mees talking about the Heavy Vehicle National Law Review. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you very much, Bill, for your kind introduction. For those who don't know the National Transport Commission, the NTC is a national land transport agency, uh, policy and law reform agency. Our work supports all Australian governments, that's the local, state and the Commonwealth to provide nationally consistent land transport policy and law reform. The NTC are accountable to infrastructure and transport ministers who meet twice a year to consider land transport reform proposals. Areas that the NTC work in you might be familiar with include rail and road safety. Some of the work we do, we administrate the Australian road rules, the heavy vehicle national law, rail safety national law, and we're currently implementing the National Rail Action Plan and undertaking a review of the Australian Dangerous Goods Code. The NTC are also currently implementing a complex reform process to update the heavy vehicle national law. So today's presentation, and thank you so much, Bill, for your invitation to join members today, is to update the heavy vehicle national law, to provide an update on the heavy vehicle national law reform process and program, and also to provide a little bit more context around three key focus areas that may interest you, and they are duties, standards, and inspections. Just to set the context for the presentation, the national vision behind the future HVNL or heavy vehicle national law is to build a better law by improving safety for all road users, supporting productivity and innovation, simplifying the law so that its administration and enforcement of the law is also simplified, support, support the use of new technologies and methods of operation and to provide more flexible and outcomes focused compliance options. This is consistent with the Productivity Commission's recent findings in April 2020 from an inquiry into the National Transport Regulatory Reform Area, which highlighted there's many significant improvements and opportunities to further promote safety and productivity and transport safety regulation. So what's of interest to you and what's actually happening now to update the heavy vehicle national law? Well, the review process of the HVNL and its supporting regulations which currently, for those who may not be so familiar with it, totals over a thousand pages. The review itself came to an end in May 2021, when ministers approved six key policy reform areas for implementation as part of the future HVNL. Now, these key areas of focus include duties, uh, technology and data, fatigue management, operator assurance, vehicles and access, and also the legislative approach, which is around what shape the new law should take into the future. To give you a sense of the process of where governments are progressing in, the, in this uh, reform, uh, across this reform program, is that the key policy directions to inform the future HVNL are actually now being refined. So post the ministerial meeting, the NTC team are now working to refine and, and uh, finalise policy proposals for ministerial consideration. We have two more meetings. So the next 12 months, or actually just under 12 months, is focused on landing all of the final policy areas and providing those to ministers for approval approval so that in the, um, the second year, which is May 2022 to 23, we can get busy drafting and uh, providing draft, a draft a bill and set of regulations for ministers to approve in May 2023. Now to get to that point, uh, working groups are currently being conducted 
across governments as we speak to work through the detail. An industry advisory group is being set up to refine policy proposals and a reformed reference committee will be continued to inform policy proposals that will ultimately be presented uh, for ministerial approval. So now looking at some of the key areas of focus for, for, uh, for, for you. So duties is a key area. Of, um, sorry, just, just give me one second. Sorry, Bill, I'm just going to have to, I've lost my notes. So pardon me. Just to give you a bit more context around this. Just bear with me as I'm fixing this up. Usually I have a little bit of system support here to take me through uh, these, these areas. One moment, I'll be with you. Oh, no, it's all good. Yeah, some, for some reason those, um, those areas just haven't come up so clearly for me to see. I'm just working through those just to make sure I give you the accurate information. Bear with me. I've got quite a small screen and a number of documents that are open uh, to support this. So one moment. Thank you for your patience. And then nearly there, of course, this is the most interesting part for you all and, <laughs> and my technology is uh, not as supportive as I would have liked it. So this will give me um, a bit of support to get through this one. Okay, one minute. All right, so in terms of duties, I have some information now I can to work through this with you. So a lot of a lot of the work around the reform areas for the HVNL is actually under, under development. So what I'm providing for you today is really a snapshot of some of the directions in which some of the work is going. So currently under duty is a draft set of reform proposals to improve the operation of the primary duty and to better manage driver health are underway as part of the future HVNL implementation. So the aim primarily is to ensure that the primary duty includes driver competency and driver fit fitness to work as well as a driver duty to not drive fatigued, which also includes not driving while unfit to work. The process is also currently investigating how to make the primary duty clearer and whether clarity of the primary duty obligations is required actually in the law itself or if suitable guidance or codes of practice are preferred to achieve clarity. This is in response to feedback we received from the Heavy Vehicle National Law Review process that the primary duty as it is currently expressed via the current HVNL is very broad and it's difficult to interpret to determine compliance under the HVNL. So a little bit more on this detail, I'll just go to the next slide. The process, and this might be most interesting for, uh, for you out there today, is the process will also investigate whether the future HVNL should specify additional parties in the chain of, chain of responsibility. And if an additional party was to be considered, a duty would only need to be charged, discharged to the, full, to the extent where that party has influence and control over the safety of that activity. It's not intended as part of this exercise that parties are to put in to be put in an unreasonable position and if and where additional parties are applied, it must demonstrate a clear net benefit to the community, to business and to the Australian society. For those who may have been around um, prior to 2014, 2015, you may recall a heavy vehicle roadworthiness program that, uh, review, which also uh, developed a regulatory impact statement. And this, is, this highlighted the cost of introducing the primary care of duty provisions on mechanics and vehicle repairers and maintainers, and that these costs actually outweighed the benefits. So what, what can you expect into the future from this area, this reform area? That piece of, piece of data will actually inform the uh, evidence base to consider if any parties need to be recognised across the supply chain due to their influence on safety 
It's not clear yet as to which parties may or may not be considered for inclusion in the future HVNL, and policy is in development as we speak. So you might be wondering, well, how can we engage with the process? So there's an industry advisory group that's being set up to support industry inclusion in the discussion. You, of course, can reach out to the NTC at any time. And Bill, I understand the ATA is also part of the uh, Reform Reference Committee, which is a group of senior industry bodies and also senior government officials that do come together to review policy proposals uh, prior to their submission uh, for ministerial consideration. And the ATA is very much a part of that process. Part of this process will also examine me any mechanisms that could be proposed, also share relevant information with duty-bound parties to support compliance. Access is, vehicles and access is actually also, is also another reform area. In May 2021, ministers endorsed a high level of ambition for productivity and safety benefits under the future HVNL. And the NTC is currently working with all jurisdictions to define the scope of improved access and decision making arrangements that can be achieved. So this work is ongoing. Also in the area of this program, which might be of interest to, to you all, is around inspections. So a draft reform proposal is currently underway to develop a new National Heavy Vehicle Regulator run risk-based national inspection scheme. Now the, the NHVR is undertaking the actual detailed development of, of this work. Uh, they're already working with governments across Australia to understand differences in all of the inspection schemes in different jurisdictions across the country and how that they're administrated and what the, the objectives and principles of each of those uh, vehicle inspection regimes are to understand how we may be able to land on one national vehicle inspection scheme for Australia. The NHVR is actually working with the NTC because obviously the NTC will need to work out how and where within the future HVNL and a national um, vehicle inspection scheme may need to be called up. This is also detail that I can't offer today, but it's certainly being worked through by the policy development professionals at the NHVR and also at the NTC to inform the future rule. So the, just giving you a bit more context around the future national uh, vehicle inspection framework that is in development, the aim of this proposal, as directed by ministers at their recent meeting in May, is to standardise vehicle inspections across the country using a risk-based approach for targeting vehicles and inspections. So this might be, for example, um, targeting vehicles that may have been of an older age or targeting high-risk vehicles depending on the loads that they're, they're carrying. Inspection methods and practices vary between jurisdictions and this process aims to provide one consistent framework for Australia. This process will also examine the vehicle defect clearance process. It will aim to provide consistency on processes for clearing defects across all states and territories and this is a process that's being proposed to be managed by the NHVR via approved vehicle examiners. So this is all the detailed development work that the team are undertaking right now. So while those details are in development, However, this could include perhaps improving guidance for authorised officers in assessing and issuing defect, notice, um, defect notices, but we're also looking at ways to minimise the administrative burden of rectifying defects. So, so looking again at greater use of that self-clearing defect notice um, process. So what to expect uh, into the future? There'll be a new regulator-run national vehicle inspection scheme in, into, the, into the future. It'll use a risk-based approach and it'll be a standardised approach uh, to inspections across Australia. There'll be certain modules that will inform implementation of the National Inspection Scheme to enable those who uh, may need to um, upskill or inform themselves more about how to implement the scheme. There'll be information that will be developed to inform that and, and also a national consistent approach to a defect clearance. Another important area of reform which may end up linking in with certification of certain modules for example for inspections but this is not defined yet is a national operator assurance framework or, or a new national certification scheme. So the idea here is to expand on and update the national heavy vehicle accreditation scheme as we all know it today. Um, through the heavy vehicle review process, the National Heavy Vehicle Review process, we understood that there is a desire to provide a more comprehensive and more robust risk-based approach to safety and alignment with the HVNL and to have a, a, a certification scheme that would support parties to fulfil their obligations under the future HVNL. It was also learned, we also learned by the, H, uh, the HNL review process that we need to support innovation and continuous improvement by sharing risk management between operators and regulators. 
it'll be an opt-in scheme uh, and heavy vehicle operators will be able to be a part of the scheme provided they meet certain scheme criteria which are currently in development and we're working closely with the NHVR to, to work this through. So what to expect into the future that may link in with the work that, that you do um, at the moment's in development so we're still defining defining those areas is a new, certif new certification scheme to be administered by the NHVR, a modular risk-based scheme linked to, linked to safety principles and also to the primary duty and to encourage a comprehensive approach to managing safety. Also, a scheme with incentives to support operators uh, to transition to and through certification. One of the key areas that Bill's asked me to talk to you about too is about standards. Now, currently there's, there's not a significant amount of standards that are expected to change as part of the, the immediate future HVNL. It's just a little bit too early to say as the development of policy is underway across all of the reform areas. So for example, under operator assurance, um, certification modules will be updated to be more robust uh, and comprehensive based on safety management system principles. Fatigue management will be simplified and the role of technology is yet to be determined. And depending on the scope of access improvements, there may be some incremental change, but this is not set yet. But in terms of vehicle standards, uh, really there, there's not much change from, from the ETC's perspective that we anticipate at this point in time. Um, Australian design rules remain the key first supply standard. Um, and this is the work of the Commonwealth and the work that the NTC does in in-service uh, heavy vehicle standards uh, guides that we provide or rules that we provide are closely aligned with the Commonwealth process and so that will continue. The only thing I wanted to highlight here around standards for something for everyone to watch is that the EU um, Commission recently approved mandatory new vehicle standards. These come into force from 2022 and they focus on advanced safety features, the so things like automated emergency braking, intelligent speed assistance. So the one to watch will be the Australian design rules process that the Commonwealth implement going forward, just to see where those, um, those vehicle standards may impact uh, our country going forward. The only other comment I could make around standards is we're looking at this, but it's definitely not defined and certainly not developed in any um, shape that I can share the detail with you today. But there may be a possibility that the law might give um, the regulator the power to set standards and for this to be recognised under law. And in one of the areas that I wanted to express this is, for example, there was a recent PBS tyre standard process. Now, this process is highly technical in nature and may be best placed with oversight by technical experts within the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator. But this is unclear um, and we're not clear whether the regulator will be able to do this independently or whether there'll be um, Commonwealth oversight. So this, still, this work is still under development. I'll just touch on, and I'm close to the end of my um, presentation here, one of the other reform areas that you may be very interested in is the development of a national technology data and information assurance and data sharing framework. It's a bit of a mouthful, um, but it's underway to inform the, the heavy vehicle national law review. Now this, this area is, is fairly critical. It, what it will aim to do is recognise the role that data and technology play across diverse parties in the heavy vehicle sector. Um, the framework aims to be technology and data agnostic and flexible enough to enable future technologies to be evaluated and incorporated as required. So what you could expect into the future, and we're just into the phase one of development of, of this uh, framework, is that the, the objectives of the framework are currently being worked through um, and, and developed. The roles and responsibilities, the function services and operating model by which a, a framework could could progress um, and be recognised in law is, is underway. Also, what are the selection criteria for, uh, for an organisation or an entity that would be the framework administrator? And if possible, um, uh, we're looking to see whether we can recommend the most suitable entity that meet that criteria. That's the immediate work that we're looking to take to the November ministerial meeting. It's still in development. For May, which is phase two, so this is May 2022, we're working on a package or a proposal that will look at the scope of data and technology to be included, determine the mechanism for recognising and communicating certified technologies, establishing those technology and data assurance levels, what those models and methods around those levels should be, and looking at a standardised data consent model and establishing some privacy and data protections. Um, and, and also looking at what structure and where and how these elements and, and mechanisms need to be called up into the future HVNL, whether it's in primary legislation and or in the supporting regulations. 
just having a delay there with my with my eye. Um, so, so everyone, really, really, that's the the summary of what I can bring to you today in terms of where the heavy vehicle national law reform program is at, and some of the, I guess, the, the elements that may have been most uh, interest to you. So, Bill, thanks very much for the opportunity to provide everyone with that broad update, and I hope that um, you know, help fill some of the gaps that you might have there right now. So, thank you very much, Mandy. Um, so, uh, people. Uh, please uh, type your questions into the uh, session uh, chat, um, and we'll um, uh, we'll uh, get Mandy to uh, to answer some of them. Uh, while you're uh, thinking, uh, Mandy, I'd like to start out with a couple of uh, moderator questions. Um, <clears throat> so, going back to the consultation RIS uh, that the NTC did and released last year, there was an option in there that talked about an operator licensing system where businesses operating trucks would have to hold a special corporate license, the road freight transport equivalent of an air operator's certificate, uh, perhaps. Um, can you tell us where governments have landed on that sort of expensive option? Yeah, thanks, Bill. So this was considered by ministers at their, at their May meeting, but under a uh, area or a document called policy not to progress, so yeah, you're quite right. Under the consultation rears last year, under operator enrolment and licensing, this was an area that was um, investigated in terms of what the impact uh, is likely to be. But where ministers have landed is that no new processes or systems for the authorisation or identif identification of operators as was described in that RIS, whether operator licensing or operator enrolment, whether mandatory or voluntary uh, mm -hmm. will proceed. Sure, thank you very much. and. Um Turning to the National Heavy Vehicle Inspection Manual, um, mm. which is a manual that enforcement officers and industry alike can use, but it doesn't have any legal status. So the ATA certainly argued in the past that this should be recognised in the law to increase the consistency of defect notices and to reduce the number of spurious uh, defects uh, that are issued. Um, can you, and I'm sure our uh, delegates uh, online have any number of examples of spurious uh, defects. Um, can you uh, please tell us uh, where, uh, where the NTC is on that sort of proposal? Yeah, so it's probably a little early to say as to where it could or should be called up in, into the law. At the moment, the focus is, is, is identifying and establishing what that inspection scheme could look like and then understanding where, uh, it, it, if it needs to be called up into law, where, where that could be called up. At the moment, it's, it's probably a little bit early in the development phase for me to to offer any information because, in fact, we're, we're still working through what, that's, that, what that scheme needs to look like with, with governments. Mm -hmm. All right. So in the absence of um, uh, questions in uh, session uh, chat, I'm going to keep asking, uh, keep asking questions. And uh, I'd like to take you back to the question of primary duties. So in the issues paper and in the regulatory regulation impact statement, there was a discussion about extending the primary duty to firstly repairers and also potentially to manufacturers. Um, are you able to share with us what your current thinking about that possible extension is? This, this area of work in terms of its development is is not complete. Um, it's due at the moment on the program for uh, for presentation to ministers in May 2022. At the moment, the work is focused on uh, looking at ways to clarify the primary duty and whether or not that can be within the, the primary legislation itself. Um, it, we haven't got to a part of the process where we've started to look at those parties in the chain of responsibility and those that will need, that, that need to be considered if or whether they will be included at all. Um, it's why I called out the work in 2015 uh, from the Roadworthiness Review that looked at this issue um, and the NTC obviously will, will reconsider that, that impact statement and, and review it in terms of where it's standing is today. But if it does not provide um, or it does not demonstrate a net benefit to 
society that that then it is not intended to be in the law. Mm -hmm. That is the principle at the moment. Um, every every single primary duty or every single party that might be considered uh, to be under the um, included in the chain of responsibility under the heavy vehicle national law will, will need to undergo a regulatory impact statement, mm -hmm. um, and that will need to be uh, reviewed and assessed before uh, any presentation of proposals to ministers. So one discussion um, that did occur in the you know, debate about what should be the, the parties covered by the primary duty was whether the list of chain parties should be definitive or simply a helpful list of examples. So, so at the moment, the list is definitive. So if you are not a chain party mm -hmm. that has one of the roles listed in the law, then you are not covered by the chain of responsibility, full stop. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a discussion about the potential to turn those into examples, which has the advantage, I suppose, of making the list more flexible, but the disadvantage of meaning that someone might be covered by the law, even though their specific role in the chain isn't covered by the legislation. Um, it, has a decision been made on, on that point as yet? A, a firm decision, no. These, these matters are normally dealt with in the drafting phase. What, what we're talking about is um, a non-exhaustive list, uh, my understanding, and that's the concept that I that I have heard. But at this point in time, it's not something that I can provide any sort of definitive, where we've landed definitively. Um, it's certainly part of that conversation around, you know, are we is the primary duty clear enough as it is? Uh, are the parties in the chain of responsibility adequate and appropriate based on um, the duties that are undertaken uh, for, for transport activities. And the debate will be therefore be around once that policy is at, at a more final refined um, position will be whether or not to make that non-exhaustive or to make it specific. Uh, yeah, I, I can't say sorry, Bill, at this, this early stage, but it's certainly something that I can let the team know that you're, you're closely watching and, and so are your members. So we have a question in the um, uh, in the chat field from uh, Sally Tipping at uh, Tipping's Transport. Um, now Sally asks, in regard to fatigue management and fitness for duty, uh, has the lack of rest areas been highlighted or considered? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sally, for the question. Um, rest areas. So Austro's undertook a pro process about two or three years ago to understand the types and styles of rest areas and the principles and objectives by which they should be developed across the country. Now rest areas and the investment in uh, rest areas and infrastructure uh, such as rest areas is in the domain of the state and territory governments. So it's not something in, in law that the NTC um, can, can provide for, but it's certainly something that uh, state and territory governments consider as part of their infrastructure investment program each year. So if there are operators out there, and this is what I would normally um, advise to, to operators that are out there who have identified priority areas where investing in heavy vehicle rest areas or ensuring that you have a rest area space, um, that they raise that with their state and territory government uh, contacts so that that can be considered in their deliberations regarding to their budget um, proposals. Okay, well, we've got, uh, we've got more questions um, coming in. Uh, this next one is from uh, Matthew uh, Booth, who's a heavy vehicle uh, instructor, uh, instructor in the uh, New South Wales TAFE system. And uh, Matthew asks, uh, under the proposed vehicle inspections, would they be done by a third party or be able to be done in-house by a transport company? And if so, would they still face periodic inspections from NHVR inspectors other than random roadside inspections? It's a great question, Matthew, and I want to take that, that question and its content back to the team. I think it's probably a good time to raise some, some of those queries and questions as they're developing this area. Um, this is something that we're, we're not in a position to be able to say what, what it can achieve yet because it's all being reviewed, assessed, analysed to be able to provide what the future inspection scheme could look like. But I think they're really valid points that um, I'd like to take back to the team if you don't mind on that one. Okay, well look, um, thanks for that answer, Mandy. I might jump ahead to uh, a question from uh, Richard uh, Calver. 
uh, at Nat Road, who's asking if it's possible to accelerate some areas of reform where clearly the current law is not fit for purposes, such as uh, minor administrative offences for fatigue, random CPI increases for outdated offences, or the requirement to carry physical as opposed to electronic documents? Thanks for the question, Richard. Yes, so these are areas, so where there are areas where we can move to expedite, uh, we're, we're investigating all possible options right now across the entire heavy vehicle implementation program. Uh, obviously, we can only move as fast as where the appetite across all states and territory and, and jurisdictions uh, sit. So, but we're working actively with them to understand what what they could look like, and that's across things such as access, correct in fatigue, and, and certainly in penalties. And we're trying to um, we're trying to deliver on that as much as we can. It's it's certainly top of mind at the moment. Okay, so um, Ashley, who's the compliance coordinator at uh, Valex Transport in uh, Sydney, was wondering um, if the um, uh, if the um, potential new inspection arrangements be standalone or if they would form part of the NHVIS? So that's a really great question because at the moment we're looking at the new certification scheme and the modules that would fit within that. So it's um, it's difficult for me to answer because a lot of this is going in, a lot of the development of the program reform areas are in parallel and there are a lot of interdependencies. So where there is the opportunity for the updated or new certification scheme to be able to accommodate um, these new certification areas, then it will. It's just in, in its early stages right now. So as that as we sort of land on something more intelligent, I would suggest that the team bring back what that looked like to be able to express that to industry and gather some feedback. But Bill, that might be something uh, that you might be able to help us with as we get to that state uh, so that we can share that. I don't have that detail yet. Sure. Okay, so people, do we have any further questions? Please, uh, please type them in. So just while we're waiting uh, for people to finish typing, uh, Mandy, to turn to an issue that um, you didn't cover in detail in your presentation, um, uh, medical standards. So I noticed in, the, uh, in your uh, presentation that one of the uh, six areas was um, uh, medical uh, standards for uh, heavy vehicle uh, drivers. Uh, is there anything that you can uh, share with us about your thinking in that area? Uh, yes, I can. I actually had a, a slide on fatigue, but I um, I didn't show that because I wondered whether that would be of interest to everybody. Um, but in terms of the of the standards, so what's occurring in this space is um, so the review of the assessing fitness to drive document is about to be completed um, that was a, a narrow review that will go to ministers in in november 2021 so this year um, the as a result of the heavy vehicle national law review part of the current reform program is to deliver and this was approved by ministers in may 2021 to design a national driver health management standard now this standard would uh, talk to and incorporate incorporate the assessing fitness to drive document but it would see it through a fit for work um, lens so it'd be looking at fitness for work um, as, as a principle by which the uh, standard would be developed so at this point in time the the standard we actually haven't started writing the standard yet uh, we've focused on the reforms related to fatigue um, so those Fatigue reforms are about landing. What are the new simplified work and rest hour rule sets that could be incorporated into the future HVNL? Um, and then looking at what some performance and outcomes based options that recognise the role that technology can play, particularly advanced safety technology in this space can play. Um, and then looking at the health standard to, to um, that, that will align with that. So, it's a process that we're currently going through, Bill. So in terms of developing, it's actually giving you a bit more meat on the bones, it'll be something that we'll be able to provide in, in the coming um, weeks and months. 
Well, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mandy. And uh, look, on the subject of uh, fatigue, um, uh, Lee Smart from uh, Formula Chemicals um, has made the point that they operate under BFM. They often have um, drivers doing 14-hour days for return trips to Albury and uh, sometimes run out of hours at Pheasant's Nest. They then need to um, be picked up by a relief driver who, of course, can then hop into a can then hop into a ute, drive to West Ride, then drive all the way to or all the way to the Central Coast in a light vehicle. So the driver has effectively driven for twenty hours, but fourteen hours of that have been in a regulated heavy vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, will that sort of issue of drivers doing uh, non-heavy vehicle hours be addressed as part of this simplification of the fatigue arrangements? It's an interesting concept. I haven't I haven't seen that being brought up directly. What I have seen is um, we're, we're very well aware of the issue that when driving hours uh, come to an end, you know, in terms of what, it, what uh, driving hours are regulated, that it is difficult if you say, for example, have fifteen or twenty minutes to get to your to the location of your home. So this particular issue is absolutely being explored at the moment. How we can actually try and help and address and support that, um, so that it's not a, an over. Um, overwhelming impost on, on heavy vehicle operations. In terms of then stepping into a light vehicle and uh, driving for extended hours uh, under that, it's something that I can take back to the team to see what, what uh, you know, to be incorporated into this exploration of this work. I guess it also comes to the, um, the sensibility test of, of how much common sense you actually have to put into to regulation or to primary legislation on, on that which you don't. It's very interestingly there are some correlations on this issue in in the aviation industry, um, but it's something that we can um, I can take on notice and, and see where the team get to. So how I, I know you you are an expert in uh, aviation fatigue regulation, uh, Mandy, amongst your other uh, talents. How how is that handled in in aviation? Uh, in aviation, if you are to uh, operate all and, and complete all of your regulated uh, flying hours, you like, for example, you're not able to then go and fly your own private plane. So if you've got a, a little Cessna parked up at the airfield, you can't then jump out of your um, commercial aircraft and then go into your private aircraft if you have uh, completed all of the particular uh, flying hours that have been contracted to your commercial um, aviation employer. So there right. are nuances throughout aviation that we could potentially draw on. But it, the question will be is, what's the size of the problem? Is it big enough um, to provide a regulatory, you know, is it large enough that the that society needs to consider regulating for that issue? And also then in terms of regulating that issue, what is the cost and impact on, on society for imposing that? So there'll be a, a raft of questions associated with it. Certainly a point uh, the ATA has made in the uh, discussion about fatigue is the need to bring the threshold for fatigue regulation down from 12 tonnes to 4.5 tonnes. Since what we've seen is that there's no real difference between the level of fatigue experienced by the driver of a heavy truck that is fatigue regulated and the driver of a 4.5 tonne truck that is not uh, closely regulated. They may have different types of fatigue, but they're equal, they get equally tired. Yet there's an artificial break point that does mean that um, uh, drivers of smaller trucks who often have less experience as well uh, end up uh, suffering from fatigue that is essentially unregulated. Yeah, Bill, thanks, thanks for raising that. This is something that we're actively working on at the moment. So we're looking at um, the scope of fatigue provisions and where that should should sit and what if the scope was to change what the regulatory impact would be on parties um, so it's a very active issue at the moment so we'll provide some advice to ministers hopefully this ministerial meeting on that matter so look I'd like to um, uh, I'd like to um, just touch on defects uh, for a moment and uh, one of our commenters has pointed out that um, the HVNL is supposed to be a consistent national scheme, yet there is still confusion with defect clearance in other states. So if I'm issued with a defect notice in one state, can I get it cleared in a different state? And uh, 
So I guess the uh, question is, this has been on the table for a while, can this be addressed mm. as part of the legislative changes? It's absolutely one of the primary reasons, yes. So we're very well aware that there are complications um, and, and sometimes, you know, complex administrative issues just to get the information that you need to do to do your job. So the, the idea here with the National Vehicle Inspection Scheme will incorporate looking at how um, having one standardised approach to defect uh, clearance. So that's what the team are currently working on at the moment. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so, look, um, one point that's been raised uh, by uh, Peter is to say that uh, many of these issues were covered by the NRTC 15 to 20 years ago, and uh, we've managed to come around in a big circle uh, to deal with them uh, again. Uh, thank you. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, a great compliment for the process that's underway. I think what, you know, as, as members, um, just making sure that, you know, we're, we're held, to, held to account in terms of how we're progressing on a number of these areas and working together with governments to be able to deliver um, what we can. Okay, well, look, thanks for that, uh, Mandy. Um, delegates, do you have any further questions for, uh, for Mandy? I'll just give it a couple of minutes while... Um... Oh, here we go. Um, so further to... Um, uh, for, this is further to Lee Smart's comment. Um, uh, about the 14-hour uh, drive. Uh, Lee points out that the driver in question is in control of a dangerous heavy goods vehicle, can't park it anywhere, and it would actually be better to allow the driver to drive an extra hour to get back to the depot than leave it parked illegally somewhere for it to be collected. So in, in analysing that particular issue, we would need to understand, uh, so for example, if this might even come back to um, route and transport planning, it might come up to, uh, about you know, looking at congestion uh, and where, you know, where that could be built into the, to planning. It's difficult for me to sort of say right now how we can solve that. Um, what we'd need to understand is more about the actual task at hand, how that's being planned for and how that's actually being operated. Granted that, you know, there's a call from industry to improve access to heavy vehicle rest areas and particularly for those with, um, you know, refrigerated trucks as well as those with dangerous goods. Um, the availability of that is, is obviously um, a point here. But I'd probably be going back to the scheduling and understanding the task and, and, and making sure that there's an appropriate level of, um, you, know, you know, time built in to ensure the safe and efficient delivery of of, of that task. It's, it may or may not be something that the law can talk to. Um, the law would certainly set the standard or the benchmark and operators would need to then, um, you know, plan how that how that freight pass would need to be undertaken safely uh, for, for their operation. There's a, probably a raft of issues in, in that particular one, um, Bill, and I'm, I don't want to really say that the law can answer them all, um, but it can certainly be a the benchmark by which uh, governments and industry can work together on that. So this may be um, a question that um, uh, has to be answered in other laws than the HVNL, but it relates to drivers who, um, unfortunately, uh, commit offences while uh, driving an operator's truck or while driving their private vehicle but the offence impacts on the operator. So this would include drug use, for example, mm -hmm. where a driver might be grounded, uh, but the police in New South Wales and Victoria, according to one of our commenters, have no obligation to inform the operator. Um, then there's the, you know, the issue of drink driving and the broader issue of, for example, speeding offences that knock a driver's uh, points down to, to zero. Now, in some states, there are arrangements of, you know, various levels of effectiveness for informing operators proactively. Is there something that could be put into the heavy vehicle national law to address this consistently? Or is this a matter that has to be dealt with on a state by state basis? That's an interesting question. So I'm just so my first thought goes to drink driving and drug laws and speeding laws are the domain of the state and territory governments um, in terms of the, how the heavy vehicle national law could or should interact with that would be a question for jurisdictions 
um, it's certainly something that we can raise with jurisdictions and test how or what channels or mechanisms are appropriate in this circumstance. Um, we'd also need to look through the lens of, um, you know, any other uh, regulate or legislation that may talk to this. For example, my first thought goes to, you know, potential privacy um, matters, but this, this would be something that we would need to consult with jurisdictions on before taking it anywhere. Okay, well, look, thanks for that. Now, um, uh, moving on to a uh, vehicle standards uh, question, an in-service standards uh, question. Uh, Kelvin uh, Nicholson from LM, LSM uh, Technologies uh, was wondering... I've lost you, Bill. Lost uh, am you. I back? Yeah. Am I back? <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Okay, am I back? Yes, I'm back. All right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kelvin Nicholson was wondering if there are any plans to mandate tyre pressure and temperature monitoring for heavy vehicles. Yeah, so this issue, I, I don't have uh, any information as to if it would apply to all heavy vehicles. I know, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, that there has been some work done by the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator in this space. Um, particularly for um, performance-based standard scheme regulated vehicles. So I don't have an immediate answer to that, uh, but certainly we can ask the regulator if they have any further information. Mm -hmm. And uh, Peter uh, has uh, pointed out that um, in the 1980s, there was actually a um, solution for interstate defect notice clearances by asking the person clearing the notice to put it in writing that it was cleared but it turned out that um, the people doing the clearances didn't want to fill in the, uh, didn't want to commit themselves to a, a written declaration. So it would seem the scheme wasn't uh, uh, particularly uh, effective and seems to Peter have um, fallen into abeyance uh, perhaps. Yes, it's, it's an interesting insight. And thanks for sharing a bit of history, Peter, as we've gone through the question time. Um, that, that would be something that it's good to note because if we're walking through what the future nat national vehicle inspections framework could look like, you know, potentially there's something in about that, who that person is, the role that person plays and um, how and, and where that person or role is authorised under the heavy vehicle national law to perhaps improve the effectiveness of that. So, so all of this is currently under consideration with the work that the regulator are doing together with, with the NTC. It's, that's, it's, it's really interesting. I think it comes. I think it comes down to the states trusting each other to um, to regulate their parties who are allowed to clear inspections. So you know there needs to be that trust there that uh, you know a New South Wales you know mechanic who is authorised to sign off on defect notices has to be trust, you know, there has to be a level of trust there from, you know, Victoria and Queensland and, and South Australia, that they all mutually recognise each other. But it's a national scheme, and unless it's to be a sort of overlay over a series of different state schemes, then all of this, all of these regulations really need to be brought together so it can be done seamlessly. The, the aim of the reform is to come up with a standardised approach so this, this issue would be accommodated by the standardised approach. The, the way that the, the shape of that is currently being worked through um, by the, the team at the regulator. So we're, we're watching that closely. So we'll see, we'll see where that lands. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, uh, delegates and viewers, do we have any further questions for Mandy? I'll just... Give you a moment to type takes a bit longer than standing up or catching one of our uh, one of our catch boxes so look everyone in the uh, absence of uh, further questions we might uh, bring this session to a close there Mandy, thank you very much for your time today and uh, and your willingness to engage with our uh, delegates. Um, and 
delegates, the ATA will be reaching out to you via your member associations for your thoughts as the process of uh, building the detail of these reforms uh, continues. It's been a big project since uh, 2018 to work on the HVNL review, but we are now getting a sense of the direction the NTC is going. So thank you all for your time today. And uh, Mandy, if you click the leave session button at the right hand corner of your screen, that will, and if I do it, that will terminate the session for everyone. So look, thank you all for your time. Uh, the recording of this session will come up on uh, the Attentify page shortly. Uh, folks, feel free to continue asking questions or making comments. Uh, I will keep an eye on it. Mandy will keep an eye on it. If there are any um, uh, questions uh, out of session, if you like, that we can answer, we will certainly do so, and we will certainly take all your views into account in the ATA's advocacy on these issues. So, Mandy, thank you very much again. And um, at three minutes to go, it's time to wrap this session up. And if we were in Melbourne, I don't know about you guys, but I'd be heading to the Packard Parts stand uh, to get an espresso coffee. Uh, so thank you all for your time and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Okay, bye. Thank you everyone, bye Bill.